Um, I want to take you all quickly through kind of why we started Honor, how we think about it. Um, we're usually known for kind of technology and how we use technology, so I'm going to take you through how technology helps the human experience and kind of the things that are hidden that you might not see. Um, and then how we've been working with senior living communities, because that's probably relevant to most of the folks in the room. Uh, so with that, there are four founders to honor. And uh, we were all in a weird spot in our lives. We sold our previous companies to either Google or Comcast. And so we were kind of in the what should we do with our lives phase. And we were looking for something with the number one guiding principle that we could look a human in the eye and know that we would make their life better. Like that was the controlling uh, variable on the next company that we would start. And it took a year and a half until I happened to go visit my mother in Connecticut and flew into Bradley. Uh, she's driving me home to West Hartford, and she's driving slow. And I said to my mother, hey, you're driving slow, and you should know the context is when we used to take our out west trips, she would get speeding tickets in Montana. <laughs> and it's possible that she let me learn how to drive in Arizona when I was something like 12. So cool mother, um, now driving slower, and she just says, well, Seth, driving's just harder than it used to be. And that was my freak out moment because she lives in Connecticut, I live in California, and I didn't wanna go back to my mom and say, geez, I'm really sorry, mom, but like, I'm going to say you have to at some point move to California to be closer to me. I want her to be able to stay wherever it is that she wants to live. And so I started looking into how can I affect this, right? Like, and what are the goods and services available to me today? And as I dove, what I discovered, and we looked at devices, we looked at home health, non-medical, we looked at everything. We didn't care about the solution. It was just solve the problem of how do we care for my mother as she starts getting older. Um, and we discovered that, that we weren't in much better place than 20 years earlier. This is me graduating from high school. Um, when my grandmother started to get older and then passed away, like very little had changed. And so it's like, why had very little changed? And then what are the real stats? So we went and looked for some data. And in 2014, if you do the math, 0.7% of venture capital funding went to goods and services for the elderly. 0.7. That's really messed up because the elderly account for one trillion of our $18 trillion economy. And if you look at the growth rate, on the elderly, then of course, this, this, this does not capture that, right? So this would say, hey, at least 6% of VC should go into goods and services for the elderly. But then when you think about, well, wait a second, the goods and services are actually not very heavily invested in today, certainly not from my industry, the innovation you know, technology industry. So you could argue a case for extra investment because it has to catch up from a tech perspective. It's not reflected, and then it's the market growth is not reflected. So this is just a way of saying my world that I come from, like venture capitalists and entrepreneurs trying to use technology to make things better, we have totally and completely whiffed it. And that was the conclusion that we came to, and so then we went around Silicon Valley and we said, hey, let's create the definitive play that Silicon Valley gets behind in order to help our parents as they age. That's our real goal, right? Like, help our parents as they age. And so we ran into this problem and people said, well, geez, technology and the elderly, really bad idea. <laughs> like, you want to do this company that's screwed because the elderly don't use technology. Um, so how could we invest in a company that's concept is we're going to use tech to improve a market that doesn't adopt it? And I um, realized as I was talking to these venture capitalists uh, that I had to talk about a car. And so I said to them, I was like, hey, guys, how many people who are older, do you know who drive cars? And they said, a lot of them. And then I said, how many people are still driving cars who shouldn't even really be driving cars anymore? And they said, a lot of them. And I said, oh, so you can go build me a car right now because it's so easy to build a car. And they're like, no, I'm not Elon Musk. And I was like, exactly, a car is technology. It just doesn't look like technology. It doesn't feel like technology, but it is technology, right? It's technology that makes our lives better, and the tech part just melds into the background. And so that's how we're gonna use tech in honor to make the lives of our parents better. And so, hence the goal, to help our parents remain wherever they wanna live with joy, comfort, and grace. And we're doing that by remaking non-medical home care, right? So it is 
going into people's homes wherever they live. It happens at people's you know, actual homes. It happens inside hospitals now. It happens in SNFs. It happens in assisted living, independent living. It happens in all sorts of settings at this point. And we are there to help with ADLs. The best way to understand Honor is really to watch this video. It's short, but it'll give you a really good sense for how it works. I think as our parents and grandparents get older, you get a little bit more concerned about them. If you're a busy professional like myself and you're working and have other things going on in your life, it's hard to make time yourself to kind of help them out. Having a care professional was a, a good way to fill that gap. My name is Cornelius Houston. I really love my caregiver now. She's been very helpful for me. I can't say enough good about Josetta. We're not used to having anyone just come in the house at all, you know, no more than family. Josetta makes me feel comfortable with her here. My clients feel like family to me. <laughs> it doesn't matter who you are. If I see that you need help and I can assist, I'll do it. That's just me. The companion element surprised me a little bit. The care professional can just come in, do their job, and leave. To have that added layer of someone who really cares about their clients is something that is very enticing to me. Because of the app and the website, it just makes it really easy for me to book appointments and make payments. I think this is the best thing that they could have come up with, was this particular app, because it cuts out a lot of friction, if you will. Someone could be having a bad day, and you might get caught in that moment with them. This just keeps all that at bay. Right after she's done, I could read the review and see how things went for that day. It's comforting. You know that somebody is there that you can trust, that you know has his best interests at heart. My name is Andrew Houston, and our family uses honor. No actors in that, by the way. Real family, real care pro, real home. Okay, so how do we think about honor, right? It seems so simple, but the problem is, is you've got this industry, as you guys probably know, it's a very large industry, but there are 50,000 agencies. No one owns more than 0.1% of the market on an operating basis, right? Which is crazy. So how do you go about fixing this? Well, what we realized, of course, is you really have to look at this from all sides of the participants, the care pros, right, who are kind of like supply in a marketplace, and the customers who would be classic demand in a marketplace, and the customers really are the person receiving care who sometimes is the direct customer, and then the kids. 60% um, of the time in our case, it's a kid buying for um, a parent, 20% of the time it's a spouse, and 20% of the time it's someone buying for themselves. And then we looked at what do people care about. So before we actually raised any money at all for Honor, we interviewed about 100 care pros, not in Silicon Valley, because Silicon Valley is a very weird place. Um, we went to Phoenix and we went to Sacramento and talked to people there. And what we heard from the care pros, number one is I want to be enabled and respected. They said, I am literally called unskilled to my face. How does that make you feel, right? And so the next thing that they said, which was also counterintuitive to us, is it's not as much about wage as it is how many hours am I getting filled. It's very hard for me to get the number of hours of work that I want. And so even if I'm making $15 an hour, which sounds amazing, if I'm only getting 30 hours a week as opposed to 40 hours a week, that's effectively a much lower wage rate. Right? So how do we solve those problems? Because really what we need to do to make home care amazing is we have to make the care pros amazing because they are our product. Honor's not actually a tech company, right? Tech's our backbone, but to our customers, Honor's a human services company, and the human is the care pro. So everything we build actually has to be about making the care pros amazing. The customer's desires are more obvious to everybody in this room, right? Quality care pro, match to the needs that I have, I care somewhat about price, and of course then we use technology to handle all of effectively the, at this point, billions of transactions that happen between those two sides. So let's focus on the care pros, because that's what matters. Like my argument to you is the number one thing that we have to do, we all have to do. I heard it in the panels earlier today, right? It's your staff, it's your people, it's a service that you're providing. That's how you create an amazing experience. And so we worked on a care pro app. It's the hardest thing that we do. Um, and I would equate the app that care pros use to Google Maps to all of you. So let me explain that for a second. Probably everybody in this room uses Google Maps or Apple Maps. 
And do you have any idea how many billions of dollars are poured into making Google Maps and Apple Maps actually work? And then, how much smarter and better are you as humans because you have Google Maps? You know how to get places. You know how to avoid the traffic. You know when something's open until, and you know how many stars it's rated. You are a smarter, better, more efficient person, and your life is better because of Google Maps. And Honor's app for the care pros is the same thing for them. It gives them a guide to how to be amazing care pros. Like, hey, before you ever walk into this customer, know that this was their proudest moment in life. Or here are their conditions. And you know, there's something on here, at the very bottom it says, mileage and parking. And that seems really obvious, right? Hey, care, the care pro, you can tap and tell us how many miles you've driven and how much you paid for parking. And just automatically, it will just credit back to you. And you know why that's amazing? Because in today's world, they have to call, yeah, Lynn knows, they have to call the scheduler at the home care agency and say, hi, this was my mileage, this was my parking. And sometimes they get paid and sometimes they don't. But the scheduler is also the person who schedules how many hours a week they get. So how hard do you think they're actually gonna work with that scheduler to make sure they get paid back if they don't get paid right away, given that that's also the person who controls how many hours a week they get of work? Ooh, right? So something as simple as that field makes honor better for the care pros. Okay. Um, just another example of things the care pros see. This is helping them with their calendars. So our care pros are our employees. They're all W-2s. But we recognize that care pros have very complicated lives, and they live really thin. Like, the, the average care pro wage is about $10 an hour in America. We always pay in any given market that we operate in, and we're in the San Francisco Bay Area, we're in LA, we're in Dallas-Fort Worth, and we're in Albuquerque. So we target 10 to 15% above the average wage for care pros in that market, and then there are ways that they can earn up and make more. Um, and so we want them to be able to pick their own schedules. We want them to be able to pick the people that they work with because they know their lives and their schedules and their need to go pick their son up at, a, at school better than we ever could. And so this example of what our tech is doing here is it's saying, hey, we have a new customer for you. It's a consistent schedule. It will replace, if you can read the font, it will replace these two other customers that you're visiting with less regularity. But if you take this, this is what your calendar now looks like. Do you want it? Right? So think about the user design that went into that screen. It's really hard for a designer to come up with that kind of a model on how to do labor deployment. But then imagine how much better it is for someone if you just say, hey, here's your existing calendar, and here's what your new calendar would look like if you decided to take this job. And so that was the model here. Um, all of this work at enabling the care pros has led us to amazing retention of the care pros. Right? The average churn rate in non-medical home care is 61% annually. It's crazy. And ours is sub 20%. And it's just because we do so much around enable, respect, drive hours, and pay. Um, what do customers see? So let's now switch over. So customers can call us, of course. Tons of our customers just call and say, hi, I want to change my schedule. Um, I, I liked this care pro. I didn't like that care pro. And our, we have a whole set of software that our um, folks use that drive the service. Or customers can do it themselves. Um, and our big thing for customers is we wanted to drive visibility and control. Beyond just, you know, everybody says, hey, I want high quality care pros. And as you guys can see, all of our software is about making the care pros high quality. But let's take care, you know, high quality care pros as a given. How do you know what kind of care your mom is getting? How do you feel comfortable that the care pro actually showed up? And so those were the questions that we asked ourselves when we designed the user experience. And this is just one little example, which is, hey, Viviana just finished her visit with your mom. And it's a notification on your phone. And it even says, if you tap in, rate it, right? Rate the experience. If your mom called you and told, me, told you about it, and by the way, your mom can rate it too, if she wants to, or she can call us and we'll input the rating for her. And then if you go in, you see the note. And I'll give you another, this is another good example of where technology can drive user experience. So our customers' number one like favorite feature about Honor is not the structured data that they get back. It's like, hey, this is when the appointment was, and this is how long it lasted, and this is how much it cost. 
Um, we even now give back a wellness check, which I'll get into. They love the subjective note that the care pro writes after every visit. And so the average note length was 150 characters. And we wanted to make that longer because customers love those notes. And so we did some work to retool the user experience for the care pros in the care pro app. And overnight, the average note length went from 150 characters to 300 characters. And it was a user experience thing in the CarePro app. Right? So this is just another example of using tech to drive human behavior to create a better experience. Okay. Um, who are our customers? What do they look like? Um, well, uh, there you go. These are the kinds of conditions that our customers have by percentage. This probably look extremely familiar to all of you, I have to, I have to imagine. And um, for every customer, they get a personalized care plan. Um, the way we do this is a uh, customer signs up through Honor. Um, they are either coming because you know, one of your facilities recommended them to us, or a hospital uh, could actually be paying for them, or uh, a SNF referred them. There are lots of paths into Honor. Um, we then go do an in-home care consultation with a separate labor force, which are our care advisors. And they work with that family to understand their real needs. We've found, we tried actually doing these on the phone. We found you cannot do these on the phone. It's impossible. You have to see the home. You have to see the person. Um, it's some stuff as simple as like, does this person have cats in their home? That's really important that we get cats in our system. Because if they have cats, we can't send care pros to that home who are allergic to cats. Right? And then I also want to call out on here the user experience design here. Because notice this is a screen that the care pros would see to learn about the customer before they start serving them. Or imagine a case where their regular care pro who normally goes is sick. And so then we need a new care pro to understand that person very quickly. And so you know, right up top on uh, Gina's thing here, it says fall risk and memory conditions. Right? So we're calling out the most important aspects, big bold up top in color, to make sure that the care pros really get it. Um, the wellness check. So we implemented this where, because we realized, look, we're in the home wherever they live. Uh, every day, every other day, you know, the average customer, I think, uses us for 25 hours a week. And um, we are our eyes and ears into that person's you know, living accommodations. And so we started asking five basic questions. You know, what's your overall mood? How is your sleep quality? Um, what is your pain on zero to 10 today? How many meals have you had in the last 24 hours? And, how, and have you had a bowel movement in the last 24 hours? And we now trend to this information. And what's really neat, with one large um, medical provider, when they send people to us, um, in that case, when they are paying for those people with us, we actually then send the wellness information back to them. They didn't want the notes in their case, so we turned the notes off because it wasn't useful to them. They needed kind of hard data to act on. So we just send them the hard data as opposed to the subjective notes. So I'm now going to talk a little bit about hidden technology, uh, stuff that drives experience that you don't see, but it happens on the servers. Usually, the best technology is the hidden technology. It's the stuff that you cannot see, but it then informs the fact that Google Maps tells you don't drive that way because little do you know, you know our hidden technology discovered that you're going to hit a closed road. So as a consumer, one of my biggest problems with non-medical home care is that if every agency is super tiny, on average 30 care pros, I probably have to call 10 agencies to get one with a care pro who has the skills, capabilities, and calendar to be able to serve my mom. Right? At subscale, they just don't have the right care pro for my mom because my mom's needs are unique, right, to yours. You, everyone in this room, you all know this. And so the most important thing about driving to scale is to have a deep bench of qualified care pros where you've coded all of their capabilities so that then you can do the right matching. And then how do you handle it when that care pro is sick one day? You send the next best care pro. That is very, very hard to do at scale. So what we do is we take all of those aspects, you know, someone who has dementia, cats in the home, um, that, you know, in schedule, so that person now needs a care pro that's dementia trained, that's not allergic to cats, whose schedule fits, and obviously geo as well. In, at our scale today, it's already billions of potential outcomes on how we could route honor in a given day. <laughs> um, that goes through a machine learning server. And then from there, you get to 
your best possible outcome for the day. And you weight things, right? Like a dementia customer who uses us regularly. Of course, the computer heavily weights. Let's get them the same person every day. <laughs> um, so you build in kind of the right weighting for each one of these characteristics. And if you do this, what you get to are the best possible outcomes back to what I started with, right? That's how you fulfill on these desires that the care pros have and then our customers have. There's another really neat place that we've, because you, you all have probably heard a bunch about machine learning recently, and I don't have this in this deck, but it occurs to me I should mention it. Another fascinating place that we've used machine learning recently is in rating care pros. Um, so you cannot rely on the ratings that you get from a home on how good a care pro is. That cannot be the only rating. Because let's say a given home has someone with dementia in it, and the kids don't live anywhere near that person's home. That person's ratings might always be a one star for every care pro that ever goes, right? And what if that care pro only ever goes to that home? Does that mean that that's a one star care pro? No. You have to use lots of other inputs to figure out how good your care pro workforce is and how good an individual person is. And so we were running into this problem, which is that every time we tried to come up with a rating set that the comp computer could use to rate care pros, our care operations team would tell us the computer's wrong. And it was a real freaking problem. <laughs> like, we can't, the humans can't figure out what variables to tell the machine to use at the right weightings in order to come up with a set of you know, ratings, you know, composite ratings for the care pros that match what the humans believe. And so we actually went to machine learning and we trained an ML system on this is what the care, these are all the characteristics of everything. We're gonna feed you all of the data in our system that touches a care pro and how they operate. And then we are going to tell you machine, this is how ML kind of works, we're gonna to explain to you machine what the humans believe are the correct outcomes. So we're gonna train you, it's kinda, you guys have probably heard, this is a cat, this is a cat, this is a cat. Can you figure out what a cat is, machine? And so we did the same thing. This is a good care pro, this is a good care pro, this is a good care pro. Can you figure out what a good care pro is, machine? And that far exceeded anything that we tried to do by human in programming the machine itself. The machine was much better at then taking a new set of care pros and spinning out to us, this is what I believe are the best care pros, when we then matched that, those outcomes against what our care operations team believed were actually the really good care pros. So that's kind of another really fascinating use of machine learning. Other things that you can do with technology that are hidden in the background. Um, pricing dynamics. So um, one of the many reasons I can now tell you, operating this across kind of multiple geographies, that home care companies will tend to stay like literally within a town or two, right? Like why is the franchise model built the way the franchise model is built? It's actually just individual mom and pops, right? In a town or two, you know, operating under one name. One of the many challenges is just pricing dynamics vary by zip code. And so we have to have dynamic pricing across multiple zip codes. Like, you know, when we're in the SF Bay Area, the SF Bay Area is kind of like, I don't know, eight to 12 different markets. And so uh, something as simple as, hey, how do you price a one hour visit? And what we can do as low as a one hour visit. Um, the industry's never figured this one out, right? It doesn't do one hour visits. It's, they're too expensive, can't get a care pro there, et cetera, et cetera. Well, but if you really look at it and you have the machine do some work, it turns out that the market does close. It's just that it closes at $55 an hour for that one hour, which is much cheaper than a four hour minimum, right? And you have to pay the care pro $40 in the zip code that this is for. And then that would vary by zip code. But it's another example of how you're using technology to be able to get to scale, and then the scale lets you have better care pros and more of them to do better matching and, and, better, um, and then a better service. Here's another really cool one. Um, this is actually an old version. So uh, this is, if you can look closely, that's the SF Bay Area. And anywhere that is red is easier to staff. Anywhere that is light blue is harder to staff. You can do your quick edge case um, check. Does this model work? Because if you can see it in the middle of the SF Bay, it's light blue. So it turns out it's very hard to staff in the middle of a water feature. <laughs> so the computer was right. <laughs> um, and this is really important because this tells us where to target staffing. But what's even cooler today, uh, our newest versions of this literally spit out lists. And it's a list of every variable 
that goes into staffing a given customer's home. And it comes out as a multiple. So it'll tell us, for example, randomly, staffing something in the city boundaries of San Francisco is 2.8 times harder than your average appointment. Staffing an eight hour appointment is 0.6 times harder than staffing your average appointment. Fascinating. So that, for example, led us to increasing supply in San Francisco, changing the labor rate in San Francisco, changing the charge rate in San Francisco, and we brought 2.8 down to 1.8 over four weeks. Right? So the computer tells you how to operate your business, and it's looking at every variable because you didn't necessarily know San Francisco. Another recent example, this was a couple of weeks ago, our care operations team was telling us weekends were particularly hard, and in fact, if you look at how uh, the kind of uh, mom and pop non-medical home care industry operates, they often charge premiums on the weekend. Everybody in this industry believes that weekends are particularly hard. So we kind of did a data analysis of that. And you know what's interesting about weekends being particularly hard? It's that, and at least in our case, our more difficult to staff customers happen to use us more on the weekends than during the weekdays as a percentage of our total volume. It had nothing to do at all with the fact that it was Saturday or Sunday. It was that we had a different customer mix on the weekends, right? And so you're, you would have, if you thought it was just weekends, increased the customer charge rate and increased the care pro, you know, care pro pay rate. And that would have been the wrong thing to do. Because if you look at the root cause that, you know, at, at the data, Really, it's that your customer mix is different, and so what are you doing about that customer mix issue? Okay. This one's super fascinating. So how do you affect, you know, everything, if you think about this, is about affecting the behavior of the care pros to be better care pros. This is a real trace pattern where a care pro is driving across the San Mateo Bridge, and they tried to check in right there where that dot is for the appointment. But the problem is, is, as you can see, the visit was up in San Francisco, and I think Ingleside in that case. Hmm. <laughs> now, what we moved to, is, see, the problem is the care pros have been trained from an industry that does not treat them very well. And so this kind of behavior is not surprising because they've been mistrained. So in kind of the old world, what you'd do is you'd call that person, you'd play whack-a-mole, because it turns out this happens a lot. And you'd call the care pro and you'd say, don't do that again and then you'd hope that they don't do it again, if you were good enough to catch it, which maybe you catch it, maybe you don't, because did the customer report that they didn't show up on time? Because they are trying to bill the customer for all the hours, right? Bad. So you can catch it very easily, GPS chip matching to the location of wherever the person's supposed to go, easy to catch. How do you fix the behavior sustainably so that you don't have to play whack-a-mole in the future? And so we started popping this window that says, are you sure you want to begin your visit right now? GPS indicates that you're not at the visit location. Never mind, or yes, I'm sure. Because yes, I'm sure is valid, right? It's totally valid. They might have prearranged, probably not in the San Mateo Bridge, but they might have prearranged to meet someone at like a supermarket, and that would be okay. Now, if they clicked yes, I'm or tapped, yes, I'm sure, the, we have this kind of feed that goes to our care operations people, and the care operations people would have seen something that came up that said, hey, call that care pro and, and find out why they said yes, I'm sure, right? Then get the humans to intervene. The effect of this is that our on-time performance is 95%. And our dominant volume is in SF and LA, 95%. 98% of our appointments start within 30 minutes of appointment start time. Um, and it's because we're using the tech to retrain the care pros on how to operate, how to be. By the way, this also protects care pros, right? Because oftentimes we get calls from a customer that says, my mom said the care pro was late. My mom said the care pro never showed up. And we can check. Right? And we can say, you know, with 99.9% .9 certainty, we, we believe the care pro was there. Right? And so it, it, it's actually both ways. Okay. Um, these are the metrics that I was talking about. These metrics for non-medical home care, especially when you're like going from home to home, which is the dominant case, um, <laughs> uh, you know, literally we have a 99.7% fill rate. Like, how do you fill an appointment, really? Like, you can't do that if, uh, if flat tires stop you from getting to a visit or a sick daughter stops you from getting to a visit. That's because we can also dynamically put jobs out into honor um, and get them filled very quickly because we can change the wage rate on the fly for something that has to get filled last minute, right? Another just tech thing that we've built. Um, but it leads to that effectively every appointment of ours gets staffed. 
Um, you know, like I said, almost all of them start on time, and 96% of the, of the ratings that we get from customers are fours and fives. Uh, so those are kind of some of the things that we look at to know that we're doing a good job. Um, so now let me talk quickly about how we've worked with partners in general and then with senior living. Um, when we started Honor, I knew nothing about healthcare at all. Um, I knew nothing about the senior living space, very little about home care. I'd done some research. Um, and so as an entrepreneur, what you do is you very quickly hire a bunch of people who uh, do know about those spaces, and then they become your eyes and ears. And uh, Lynn actually was telling me that she knows Kelsey, one of our first hires who knew about the healthcare system, for example. Another first hire was someone who knew about uh, uh, home care workers and labor. So you hire good people, but then you also listen to people. And so we were fortunate that when we did uh, launch, a bunch of people came and talked to us very quickly. Um, so what we figured out is, okay, there were like just a lot of challenges at working with existing non-medical home care because fundamentally everything's a mom and pop. Even if it's got a franchise brand on it, you know, the East Bay franchiser of something operates completely different with a different set of care pros than the San Francisco uh, version of the same theoretical company. So it's just not standardized and you can't really do something that covers wide swaths of geo, um, nor can you feed reliable information back and forth. And so, First, to partner with anyone, be it you know, a living community, be it a hospital, be it a nursing home, we needed to make sure that we were addressing kind of the def deficiencies of the industry. Um, I think our, just our basic approach of, hey, you've got data, you can deliver reliable customer plans, you can see what happened inside the home, um, and we operate uh, you know, effectively when we go into an area like the SF Bay area, we operate in the entire thing, or DFW, et cetera. Um, and then we started partnering with the disease-specific organizations. Um, we wanted to make our care pros truly excellent at the very specific diseases and uh, comorbidities that we were finding coming into Honor. And so, for example, we just ran an Honor Care Symposium and the Heart Association, the Alzheimer's Association, the Cancer Society all came and spoke um, to a bunch of people that we partner with in the SF Bay Area in that case. Um, so we're trying to make our care pros excellent at very disease specific things and then we have been partnering as I've said with the medical system um, and largely partnering with the medical system is about uh, if they have customers that they want to make sure they help not readmit or if they believe that they could actually get someone to home faster they you know from their point of view they can free up a bed faster um, they can get someone to a lower acuity, acuity setting faster um, they can skip going to a sniff right, if honor's there. So that's a bunch of the stuff that's been happening in the, uh, in the medical space. Um, and I think that, uh, and so then, in partnering with senior living, this, you know, a lot of these goals are the same goals I think you all have, right? Like, how do you keep people in your facilities? How do you not have to have someone, like, you, you never wanna have to send someone to the hospital, right? You never want them to have to go to a SNF. Um, how can we drive that? How can we drive length of stay? And so there are really um, two models that we've uh, started to deploy with the uh, living communities. One is what we think of as the lighter model. It's a referral partner model. Uh, we do this all the time today, and it's where a, a living community will re just refer individual customers in. And if there's a lot of volume, then sure, we could you know, put someone on site. Um, sending data back and forth is actually pretty easy, but this I really think of as the light model, and it just streamlines. Well, we often create a dedicated phone number or a dedicated number that people text just to be able to quickly um, send referrals into Honor. The more interesting one that we started doing recently is we've literally been creating effectively co-branded services with people. Um, and this is where a community now wants to be able to offer uh, personal care services to its uh, residents, the community does not want to handle the staffing, does not want to handle the logistics, does not want to handle the call-offs of what is often a very different kind of staff. And so it becomes branded as the community and co-branded with Honor. Um, it's a pretty deep integration. So like data, the expect, we, we have this way in our tech where the expectation is that wellness check, for example, would become available to the community so that the you know, services and supports that you all have for your residents, they're aware of, hey, this person for the last two days has reported higher pain. What are we going to collectively do about it? So it's a much deeper integration. Um, the whole point is to deliver better services to the residents of these communities. 
um, to really have a set of eyes and ears on what's happening constantly. And so now when you've got kind of a, we hear this all the time and again, like I was new to this, when you've got a smorgasbord of a bunch of different services coming into your community, it's hard to know what people are actually receiving, right? And they're receiving something different from one than another one. And so this standardizes those services that are coming in into one and then you are now in the data flow, right? From a tech perspective, you're in the data flow so that you know what's happening with those customers. Want to close with this? From April of 2015, real right? Every month my mother was in the hospital. In the last, yeah. since you guys have come aboard in December, she hasn't had to go to the hospital. And I wanted oh. to tell you that in person because that's what I'm trying to send this email for. So I want to thank you and I wanted you to tell whomever, the people, all the people, thank you very much. This is the oh. first time. Some of the pressure has been off of me from taking her to the hospital. And your crew, your people that you sent here, you tell whoever runs your company. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> and Aww. if they want me to make a testimonial, <laughs> I'll do it, all right? Even though <laughs> I got a lot of um, So I'd love to, that's, that's, that's honor. Um, if you want to get in touch and understand more about how we've been working with senior living communities, just ping sliff at joinhonor.com. Um, I've got it set up so it'll go to the right teams. I'll get those emails today too. Um, uh, probably tomorrow I won't, but <laughs> today I will. Uh, and any questions that you all have, you know, fire away. Outside of the uh, San Fran area, are you in other um, geographic locations? Yeah, so we launched in the San Francisco Bay Area, actually specifically in Contra Costa then to all SF Bay Area. Then we launched LA. So we're in the San Fernando Valley and LA Basin. Um, then we launched Dallas-Fort Worth. Um, and then we launched Albuquerque. So we're in four major metros right now. And you can expect that, obviously, to expand. Um, it's uh, actually not that hard for us to launch new geos. Uh, to this point, we've been launching new geos to constantly learn and get better. Like launching DFW was about different state regs multi-hour flight, different time zones, different culture, and we wanted to understand all that. But our theory was, if you can do DFW well, then you can also do Nashville and Atlanta. Um, you know, Albuquerque is a smaller city that's isolated. Another kind of like, if you can handle Albuquerque, then you can handle Flint. Um, albeit we haven't done snow yet, for example. So the next, you know, when we launch a snow city, we'll have to build the features to handle snow. Um, but that's where we are so far. We have time for uh, one more question here, Sierra. Can you talk to us about trainings? Because you're double w twoing people. Um, just you know, how are you making them skilled if they're not coming skilled, and what does that really mean to you, skilled versus unskilled in home care? Yep, great question. Uh, so I didn't talk about this, but for a care pro, just to even get in to honor, um, right now it's eight percent of people who apply make it in. Um, so it's very hard. And then they go through an orientation which has embedded training. So there was a slide in there that said, for example, 100% are trained on lifting and transferring. 70% um, are dementia trained. Uh, so they go through a training program up front. Then we have recurring trainings that happen as they're here. And what's, uh, a lot of what we discovered with this industry is people will sell, say they have trainings but they don't pay people to come to the trainings and they don't require the trainings. And we can just turn care pros off on the app if they don't come to the trainings, and we will. <laughs> um, so everyone has to go through recurrent trainings. Everyone has to go through the first trainings. Um, it's in person. This is all in person, yeah. So there's another aspect which I think is important to recognize, which is, so we have, everywhere we operate, we have our physical centers, right? And that's where we do our trainings. That's where we do our screenings. Like, we screen people in person, too. We drug, te you know, drug testing. All that happens um, uh, in honor. Uh, it's important to recognize that you're doing a bunch of training through the technology as well, though. Uh, so when you're, you know, like, doing that, thing where you're popping up a screen that says, hey, are you sure you want to start the appointment now? That's actually also training. Or this person has dementia, remember to wear your name tag at this particular home. That's also training. Um, so yeah, we do a whole bunch of in-person trainings and everything I was talking about before was in-person training. Uh, but then there is a bunch of training that happens through the technology as well. Thank you so much for right, joining guys. us. Thank you so much. Congratulations.